We are live. Welcome to My Show Horse App's first ever Dressage Stars Google Hangout series. Located at showhorseapp.com, My Show Horse Checklist is an online tool designed to assist in packing your horse trailer for shows, clinics, lessons, whatever kind of horse related event it is that you are going to be hauling out to. I'm your hostess, Patricia Rezzatello. And today I am very pleased to present Peter Dove of Master Dressage. Hi, Pat. Hi, Peter. Peter is a longtime equestrian and a longtime student of Mary Oneless. He has judged dressage since 1995 and is a forthcoming author of Master Dressage. Rather, that's a forthcoming book of his. Um, which teaches how to improve your, your marks or your scores um, in dressage competition. The back of the book says, Equestrians are no longer satisfied with vague instructions, the mystique of talented riders, or the mishmash of teaching methods, all of which contradict each other and lack long-term effectiveness. Riders want answers. Riders today are more intelligent about their training more concerned with the welfare of their horse, and greatly concerned with using ethical training methods. In the book, you'll discover how to develop a better relationship with your horse, how to develop an end-to-end -end strategy for training yourself and your horse to effectively compete in dressage. Peter shows you the map, gives you the right tools, and is your guide to a more successful, more enjoyable, competitive experience. Sounds about right. <laughs> uh, just a moment here. I'm trying to find my... Oh, never mind. <laughs> so, Peter, would you like to share how you got started riding, how you got involved with horses? Well, I actually got involved with horses a little bit late on. Um, I think I was about 19 year old when I was first introduced to a horse. And uh, I had a, a girlfriend whose uh, mother had a horse and, and she had a horse and I was introduced to riding at that point. Um, and the bug really sort of bit me uh, there and uh, I, was, I was kind of urged to get into racing, you know, because uh, at the time I was, you know, eight and a half stone, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm quite a short chap as well, so, you know, uh, racing seemed to be the right thing to do. So, you know, I, I tried to find a racing yard uh, and unfortunately with my lack of experience of riding, I couldn't find a, a racing yard to take me on. <laughs> so, I ended up in a uh, British Horse Society uh, training center where I started life as a working pupil with, uh, you know, 10 pounds a week as, as my wages and, uh, you know, I, I stayed there. And, you know, I started learning riding and I really sort of got interested in uh, dressage, you know, more than racing. Uh, so I, I went through my BHS stage exams and, and passed various exams. Uh, and, you know, it was not long after that that I started teaching. Um, you know, I, I went to a couple of yards and, you know, eventually I settled at a yard uh, for some, you know, serious training. Uh, and it was at that point that I kind of got very frustrated with riding. I'd been told initially that I was talented, you know, that I that I learned really quickly, and that kind of worked up to a point. Um, I I was really under the impression, you know, that it was my job to make the horse do what I wanted it to do. You know, that uh, if the horse wasn't doing what I asked, it was resisting me or evading or you know, it, it, essentially the horse was being a pig, you know, that's, that's, that was almost the whole sort of uh, ethos and it was my job to make it happen. And you know, that became very frustrating for me, you know, I didn't have anybody that could uh, use language effectively to describe what it is that, you know, talented riders do. So I got into a bit of a rut and it was about that time that I picked up the book Ride With Your Mind and uh, I think in the US it's called The Natural Rider. That's uh, Mary Wanless's first book. Now my instructor at the time was away for a week and uh, I, that's when I picked up the book. And 
I can't. I remember the look on her face when she came back because uh, we had this horse called Falcon who was uh, extremely bouncy. I mean, you know, you just couldn't sit to his trot, couldn't sit to his canter. Within a week of reading that book, I had learned to sit to the trot and sit to the canter, and uh, you, you know, it changed my life. And you know, not long after that, I. Uh, was able to have uh, lessons with Mary Warnless, and and she really completely changed my view of riding. You know, um, in fact, I remember her inviting me to s once saying that if you ever find yourself saying, "Oh, you're such a pig," if you if you or "Oh, you're you're such a pain," if you're saying that to your horse, turn it around and apply it to yourself. Say it to yourself. See how that feels, <laughs> because truly, you know, you're ninety percent responsible for what's happening underneath you. You know, it's it's your responsibility to learn how to speak horse. It's your responsibility to to figure it all out. You know, um, Mary has this great fa phrase. You know, she says, um, you know, horses are just horses. They just do what they do. It's like saying water flows downhill. You know, it just happens. That's just the way they are. You know, and no matter, they don't stand in their stable 24 hours a day going, I wonder how I can make my rider's life a real pain in the neck. I wonder what I can get. It's not, it's not how they roll. <laughs> you know, they're just horses and it's up to you to learn to speak horse. So, you know, it, it Mary pretty much kind of saved me from all that frustration and, you know, she really uh, explained the mechanics of how riding works. So I'm eternally grateful to Mary. Uh, I do still work with Mary. Uh, she, you know, teaches me when she can and, you know, I help with uh, Mary's website. Um, so it's it's really great to be so close to her and, and hear her, uh, you know, her ideas and, and the stuff that she's working on. I mean, I come at uh, teaching and riding through a, a very slightly different angle, um, but my foundation is uh, entirely the sort of you know ride with your mind approach. Yeah, so that's exciting. Um, going over to the book, what factors brought you to decide to write a book? That tends to be a pretty ambitious undertaking. Um, and and to build the lovely informative website and do all the work that you're doing to assist writers in their quest for lovely writing. Well, you know, um, I've been judging permanently at the equestrian centre that I'm based uh, since, well, since we went there, me and my wife first started it. Uh, so that's like nearly 15 years. So, you know, I've been judging every month almost for 15 years. Um, you know, I've been teaching there for 15 years. I've been doing uh, practice judge tests where, you know, riders come, they they ride a test, I coach them for 20 minutes and, and then they ride the test again and, and hopefully, uh, you know, score more marks. Uh, so I reckon I've judged or taught close to 7,000 riders over that period of time. And, you know, when you've been judging for that long, I think I just noticed the same mistakes happening over and over and over again. Um, you know, I think at one point I was like, why can't anybody just ride a circle? Why is everyone riding, you know, squares with with chamfered corners? And, um, and so I think it was at that point one particularly frustrating day where I actually decided to make a video and uh, put that on the internet, and that got a lot of views. That was, uh, you know, really interesting. Um, and I had a number of people saying, well, why don't you put out more? Why don't you, uh, you know, write all of this stuff up? Why don't you? Uh, try and come up with a framework with which you can teach this to people. So that's what really pushed me to start doing the videos, start the uh, Master Dressage um, Facebook page, you know, and that started out uh, the 6th of January and we're now close to 8,000 fans on that page um, and, you know, it's, it's going up all the time so I'm getting a lot of good feedback and it's really fun interacting with people and uh, yeah I can't wait to finish the book and you know start producing more videos. That's very exciting. Um, so how is the world of writing changing? In your book it says it's changing. H how do you see it changing? Well I think it's changing because you know the world's expanding, people's knowledge is expanding. I think people are actually getting 
much more responsible about uh, how they approach their training, how they approach their learning. Uh, there's so many books and, and DVDs out there that people are really uh, th they want to know, you know. They, they they're not just happy going and having a lesson and being sort of shouted at and and then go back home and no longer think about their riding again. You know, the, the people are starting to realise that that's not the way learning works. We don't sit on our horses and get shouted at for an hour and then go away and be happy with that. <laughs> um, a, 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 um, an analogy Mary uses a lot. She says. Um, she's always amazed at what people pay for in terms of lesson quality so you know imagine you're a golfer and you go for a golfing lesson and your instructor says right buddy what I want you to do is to hit the ball down the fairway and make sure it goes straight now if that's if that was the instruction you received how happy would you be now if we move ourselves into a dressage arena and and you know the instructor says I want you to ride shoulder in down the long side and make sure he stays on on you know three tracks <laughs> you know it's the same it's the same thing that they're, they're not telling you how to achieve this kind of thing or you know I want you to go across the diagonal and really increase the impulsion or or I want your horse to do medium trot really lengthen those strides what what information is this <laughs> So you know, I think people are starting to realise that uh, you know there's got to be uh, the how to rather than you know the ho the the the, um, the how to rather than just saying do it you know how and I think that's really challenging for instructors actually you know it, it's it's great it's a great thing we're having to improve ourselves figure out ways of saying things uh, and, and really turn those things which are just feelings into words. Yeah. I hope that was clear. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And one one issue that I've seen uh, dressage teachers having is being very specific. One example that comes to mind is you're posting a trot and your instructor says slow down and so you're, you're slowing the trot and slowing the trot and what they actually wanted you to do was go to the walk and not slow the trot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We need so, to be clear, you know, there's 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 a huge slippage in, in what you say and you know what a person hears and what they finally do after after that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So do you think that the internet and the fact that writers around the world are able to communicate uh, more freely do you think that's had a big difference um, with how people, I don't know, just attitudes and how they want to learn and what they want to learn? Yeah, I think, I, a big... yeah, I think that makes a, an enormous difference. You know, people are able to exchange knowledge, uh, talk about the lessons that they've had. And, you know, as soon as people start to communicate with, with each other in such an open fashion, you know, a language starts to develop, people uh, start to compare the lessons they've had with the lessons that other people are having. And, you know, I, I think the, the trouble with the equestrian language is it's so limited, heels down, sit up tall. You know, we, we have such... Uh, useless phrases try and describe very complex uh, things that are happening. So yeah, you know, um, there is a huge range of uh, information out there and I think people are willing to experiment more. You know, oh I, I read this thing on the internet, I'll go and try it. And, and you know, people are, because of the internet and because of online video training and uh, uh, books that they can buy, they're starting to think about riding off the horse. They're starting to think about it, you know, dur during that time between they get off their horse and, and the next time they ride, which is really, you know, often where the learning uh, occurs. Yeah, yeah, you know, we, we, we learn a lot while we're, we process, rather, between the time where you actually do the riding and the time that you go and ride the next time, you're processing in between. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, what can you tell us about the map that you give riders? Ah, the map. So, um, you know, when they do um, uh, 
practice judging when when people come into the arena to practice the test and they get judged uh, I, I hop down into the arena and I'm going to teach them I need to decide what it is that I'm going to teach now uh, I can choose one of two things the the first thing is the kind of rider biomechanics side of it which you know is uh, let's say the rider is busy being run off with in the trot or, or you know has no uh, the horse has no energy or the, they can't keep the horse out on the track or you know, whatever whatever the biomechanical issue is if it's down to their riding then obviously we'll work on that because it's it's the thing that needs fixing the most and that's actually usually the question that I ask when I go into the arena is you know what will what fix will make the biggest difference to this rider in the shortest space of time uh, the other side of it is how they're riding the test you know where they're losing marks um, how they can pick up extra marks uh, whilst they perform the test. So the the uh, paradigm for master dressage really is uh, how to teach dressage riders to uh, pick up extra marks, how to avoid losing marks and to try and teach them what it is that judges are looking for and you know obviously when I'm teaching people personally I switch between both methods where you know whether it's the rider biomechanics side or the you know how you you get more marks in a dressage test. Um, so my kind of map looks like uh, five steps and the very first step that I teach people is accuracy. And you know what I mean by accuracy is getting them to understand uh, the mechanics of the movements that they're performing. Uh, trying to teach them to understand how to get the, the measurement of the movement into their head. So, you know, what does a 10 meter circle look like? What does a 15 meter circle, what does a 20 meter circle look like? And, you know, giving them hints and tips on how to make those circles accurate. You know, for instance, one of the very simple things that you need to learn when you do a 20 meter circle anywhere, or, or a circle of any size actually, is uh, let's say you, you're doing one at E. The question is, what angle do you need to start turning the horse away from the track at? You know, what's your angle of attack away from the track looking like? Do you know that? Can do do you know every single time, and can you reproduce that? Um, it, it that actually is like, for instance, when you come up the center line. You know, when you're competing in a indoor arena, you have to kind of go around the edges, and at some point, you have to turn up the center line. Well, do you know the radius of the quarter circle that you start your turn at? Most people drift and then kind of try and figure it out and find they've overshot the center line and so on. Um, and, the, and the sort of third element to that really is the typical errors that riders make whilst they're doing their dressage tests. Um, you know, these cover things like people do 20 meter circles at A and they end up going into their corners. You know, they, they're actually past, past A, let's say they're on the left rein, they're going past A and they're still on the track. You know, they, they believe they have to leave the track somewhere, you know, around F or something like that. Um, and I see a lot of square circles. So really, it's it's improving their accuracy, talking about typical errors. Um, you know, even in the lower level tests, another typical error is when you go up the center line and you have to turn left or right. The number of horses I see approaching judge and kind of, you know, doing this as they, as they get up towards C, the horse has no idea which way they're supposed to go. So that's accuracy and you know I spend a, a lot of time on that and a, another reason why accuracy is really important is because it gives you a measurement to where you're supposed to be. You know exact, let's, get to, let's take an example. Um, when I teach people uh, circle, circle shapes, let's say we will choose a 20 meter circle. I tell them to imagine they're trotting top of one of those gymnastic balance beams and it's just wide, no, wide enough for the horse to trot on top of. So I get them to imagine a huge 20 meter circle balance beam, perfectly circular. And the question is, would you know which side of that balance beam your horse would fall off at any particular moment? Can you be that accurate that you can trot all the way around this balance beam and your horse wouldn't fall off left or fall off right. 
you know, if you're on the right rein and you know your horse is going to fall off lefty, he's obviously falling out through the shoulder. If you have that model of accuracy in your mind, it's much easier to notice when you lose your accuracy. It's much easier to notice when yours is falling out or, or is falling in. But if you're just blithely drifting across the arena, you won't know if you're falling in or falling out or accurate or, or not. So it's really important to have a basis of accuracy and, and really understanding uh, what the movements are supposed to look like. And I have loads of fun with that, uh, you know, drawing shapes in the arena. And I've got some videos of, uh, of me doing some 10-meter circles and, and actually drawing them out on the arena floor. So <laughs> I'll try and move a bit more quickly now, Patricia, sorry. Uh, fluidity. Um, this is the next stage. And really, fluidity is about, um, you know, mo moving from one movement to the next and understanding how you must change your horse out of one movement and into another. So some of this is is preparation. Uh, an example of this uh, would be, uh, let's say you have to turn uh, left at, um, let's say you have to come up the center line. You know, uh, getting a slight bend just before you turn, that's part of the preparation. You know, turning left or right at any marker, you need to create a small amount of bend, then make the turn. Whereas you find a lot of people start the turn and try and get the bend. Simple little things like that to prepare will make it look a lot more fluid. Uh, the other aspect of fluidity is uh, prevention of errors. So this is kind of also, uh, almost uh, understanding your horse's tendencies. So if we start at a really low level, you often, uh, at the lower levels, you have riders striking off on the incorrect lead. Now, the, often that happens is because the horse is bent too much to the inside and, and falling slightly on the outside shoulder, and, and as the horse goes to strike off, it's actually reaching into that outside shoulder. Now, if you know that, and you know that's your horse's tendency on that particular rein, you can just straighten that shoulder up a little bit more, make sure your horse is straight before you give the aids. So it's just understanding your horse's typical tendencies and being one step ahead of the game. So the the next element is understanding and what I mean by understanding is understanding the purpose of the school movements. Understanding how these school movements can train your horse, how they how these school movements can help improve your horse. Um, so let's say, for, and actually this is also from the judge's point of view as well, I often give um, a an explanation of the understanding of movements from the judge's point of view. So let's take free walk on a long rein. What is the judge looking for in free walk on a long rein? What is the purpose of free walk on the long rein? So the key term here is first of all long rein. And, and what free walk on a long rein does is first of all it shows that your horse is happy with the contact. Um, and that he reaches towards your hands. You know, when, when you have a horse correctly round with its back lifted and out on the end of the rein, you'll feel a very slight weight in your rein. And if you were to push your hands forwards, your horse would simply follow that contact, almost as if your reins were made of kind of like iron rods, and you were literally pushing your horse's head away from you. And, you know, that horse is so reached over its back, reached into the rein, that wherever you put your hands, the horse is happy to follow that contact. So when you do free walk on a long rein and you push your hands forward, what the judge is expecting to see is the horse lowering its head, reaching over its back. So that kind of demonstrates that your horse is to the contact and is, is happy in the contact and is supple and will stretch. If you read the little sort of side notes, especially on the British uh, dressage test, I don't know about the US test, but they give little directives uh, for the judge. So in free walk and a long rein, it will say the horse must reach forward and down. It must over track in, in the walk. Uh, so the purpose of the over tracking is to show that the horse is actually still supple all the way over its back. Because you imagine as it, as it reaches more down with its neck, it's actually pulling the muscles all the way across its back and down the hamstrings as well. Now, if the horse is tight, he, he won't actually overtrack. He won't take those long steps. His steps will remain short. The head and neck might go down, 
but he won't take the long steps. So a free walk and a long rein will demonstrate that your horse is completely supple all the way across the top line, is happy in the contact. Now, if you can teach your horse to do this, and you understand the reason for it, you've got a great tool when you know you're in a situation where your horse is a little bit tense, or you're in a, or you're teaching a horse a more advanced movement, and you can just push the hand away a little bit, get the horse to reach into the rein, get him to relax a little bit, and then re-ask for the for the movement that you're trying to teach him again. So understanding is very important, very important in training, very important to understand. Uh, what the judges are looking for, what is the purpose of these movements that you're doing in the arena. You're not just doing movements for movement's sake, they demonstrate a number of precepts to the judge and show that the horse is correctly trained. So practice is the next element and um, you know it seems a little bit obvious, well of course we, we have to practice, but uh, you know only perfect practice makes perfect um, and this actually goes all the way back through fluidity and accuracy you know you have to really understand what it is you're practicing moment to moment and make sure that you you stay completely focused from moment to moment because everything you do matters everything you practice matters you're training something every moment <laughs> Now you know if uh, I, you know, and I've been guilty of this. I've you know uh, been cantering, you know, twenty meter circle, fifty meter circle. You know, we've been doing uh, half pass, and I'm knackered. You know, I'm like, <gasps> and we just go bleh into walk. <laughs> you know, well, what have I just trained? <laughs> you know, I just trained whilst go out the canter and go bleh into the walk. <laughs> so. You know, it's a great responsibility training a horse. It's so hard. You, you really have to stay focused and keep that in the back of your mind. What it, is it that you're practicing right at that moment in time? Um, you know, uh, one of the things that um, helps is to have clear goals when you go into the arena. Know, you know, what it is you're going to be working on. Sometimes that completely changes, of course, but, you know, you should have a, a general idea in mind of, what it is you're trying to improve and really keep your level of focus. Uh, there's lots of tools you can use to increase your level of focus. Um, one is uh, a little numbering system. So uh, I have this system when I'm trying to teach people uh, to have a consistent rhythm. I'll say, uh, and this is actually uh, comes from Mary. I mean, I don't take any credit for it at all. Uh, but she says, um, let's take the numbers from 1 to 10. And five is perfect rhythm with perfect power. So that that's, you know, your trot looking fantastic. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten is your horse getting faster and faster and faster um, and kind of speeding away from you and, and you losing tempo control. And, you know, four, three, two, one is the horse losing energy, getting slower and slower and blah, um, you know, until you're at zero and it's, Fallen over on its side and having a snooze. So you want to be, <laughs> you want to be asking yourself what number is it, and trying to come up with a number off the top of your head. Now, you want to be asking yourself that quite often, and you know you can start to get to a point where you notice, you know, a 5.5, or or a 4.5, or a 4.75. You know, you ought to be able to really notice this loss of rhythm, this this speed up of the tempo, the slowdown of the tempo, and be able to make adjustments and get to a point where you can keep your horse at a five with perfect rhythm and perfect power and you're so attuned to it going very slightly wrong you know that to the observer it looks like this one beautiful fluid performance you just keep doing five all the way around but really what's happening is you know you're figuring out it's a 4.8 or a 5.2 and you're making very small adjustments rebalancing applying your leg all these things happening with very small aids and that's the other thing about getting focus and really learning to notice is that you can make small adjustments immediately. I have this uh, little phrase that I use um, for uh, riders that are at that kind of stage where they're making corrections but they're doing them too slow and they're having to make them too big. Now I don't know if you know the film Robin Hood 
Prince of Thieves with Kevin Costner in it. There's a great scene where um, Robin's fighting Little John in the river, and Little John kind of wallops him, and, he, and he, he's, he's on the floor in the river, and he looks up at his Saracen friend as if to say, you know, what now? And his Saracen friend sagely says to him, get up, move faster. <laughs> and I often repeat this to people, you know, it's kind of like they've got to react quicker, you know, they've just got to stay focused and react quicker to what's happening. Not react uh, more harshly, but just kind of, you know, stay focused, stay in the moment and, and react. So uh, just quickly to finish up practice, uh, mental rehearsal um, and off-horse practice does come into this equation as well. So there are a number of exercises people can do off the horse. Um, there's quite a lot you can do with mental rehearsal, especially for practicing for a test. The final stage of this very long piece of the uh, evening is review. Um, and I don't think enough people do review well enough, especially when it comes to uh, dressage competitions. Now, in one of the videos that I've put out, I actually uh, added underneath the video a spreadsheet. And in this spreadsheet, you have down the left-hand side a list of movements, dressage movements, 20-meter circle, uh, working candle left, uh, you know, change the range to, through two half 10-meter circles. So whatever it is level of test you're doing, all the way down the left-hand side. Across the top, there are repeating columns. So it says mark, comment, mark, comment, mark, comment. And above each mark, comment pair, you've got the date of the competition that you did. And the purpose of this is, you know, you should actually go out and compete, like, say, three times in a short period of time. The purpose of this is to start to look down through your movements and see the typical marks you get you know, because you could get a different mark on the left rein for the same movement as to, to the right rein. So go through, have a look at the marks, have a look at the comments. You know, you could see something like uh, on the left rein, uh, the, for a 20 meter circle, the judge says, uh, falling out, uh, unbalanced, circle too large. You know, and that should really give you a hint as to what's going on. And, and hopefully you can see these patterns and actually begin to realize where you can focus your practice, improve your accuracy, and get extra marks in that place because there's lots of places that riders throw away marks. Um, and of course, you know, you can use this sheet as well to speak with your coach. You know, when I talk about review as well, you know, I, I hope riders will uh, take more responsibility for their own learning. You know, if they have a coach, whoever that coach is, you want to be going to your coach and asking questions, you know. Uh, this keeps happening in my tech. How are we going to fix this? What are we going to do? How does that work? How do I improve this? This isn't working. What, are, what, how, you know, what am I not understanding? It's, it's up to you as a right. Don't, don't go for your lesson. Be shouted at and be happy. Go to your lesson. Ask questions. Demand answers. And, and, and really just be, uh, I don't know, what, what the right, tenacious. That's the right word. You need to be tenacious with your instructor and get the answers that you need or find another instructor. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think you know, that's, that's kind of my uh, map. And you know, it, that was quite a sort of short one. In the book, especially for the uh, accuracy uh, and fluidity understanding sections, you know, these are really big sections of the book and really cover the typical movements from um, you know, prelim level up to elementary uh, in the UK. Uh, I don't know what that is um, in the US, you know, but uh, elementary starts introducing the, the lateral movements, uh, you know, and doing things like simple change through canter on two half 10 meter circles and so. So I'm not quite sure how that equates to US. But that's the level the kind of book goes up to, um, you know, mostly because we just run out of space if we kept going. <laughs> Hope that made some sense. Yes, absolutely, and and very good information, regardless of what level a person is at. Uh, and what tools do you believe a rider needs? Well, you know what I think. It's a big responsibility on the rider riding these days. I, I think we have to know so much 
um, you know, you need to first of all you really need to have a good understanding of rider biomechanics and uh, how you affect the horse, how the horse affects you. You, know, you can't get by without that kind of thing. Uh, you need to develop test riding skills, you need to develop a, a real understanding of you know, what judges are looking for, how to improve your uh, test marks. Uh, you need to have training skills. I mean gosh how many people have a horse and then go into an arena to school and are kind of like, well, what do we do? <laughs> you know, there's, there's a whole sort of, I think, a, a missing um, knowledge area, which I hope to get across in the book, about what do you do when you get into the arena? You know, oh, we'll, we'll try a 20-meter circle, we'll do a few transitions, we'll, we'll have a canter around, but, you know, what's the training structure? What are you trying to achieve? Uh, we, you know, you need to understand nutrition, um, you know, it's just a big responsibility uh, for riders and, and you know it is 90% down to us how well the horse goes you know so uh, it, it's not easy there's, the <laughs> there's no silver bullet you know I, um, I think he, uh, Mary says that as well in fact actually Mary makes such massive changes with riders you would imagine that you know there is a silver bullet but uh, what comes what comes with the silver bullet is you know you get your aha wow this, this change has made a big difference but then you have to actually go away and keep practicing it until it becomes second nature and, and that's really you know the same with any type of skills like test writing skills or accuracy or you know those kind of things so yeah poor riders we've, we've got a lot to learn <laughs> okay um so tell us a little bit about the app. I know you've been working on an app and it looks really interesting. Tell us a little bit about that. Ah, uh, yes. Well, you know, I had this sort of issue where I wanted to produce uh, more videos. And do you know what? It's really hard to just click your fingers and have a rider appear in the arena that is willing, able, and happy to demonstrate something for you and something going wrong and be able to recorrect it again when it, after it's gone wrong and for you be, to be able to capture that on film just there and then and you know and then for somehow to get different angles on that whole thing happening <laughs> so you know um, that's why I came up with the idea of Master Dressage 3D so you know that I could actually get a, a 3D horse, a 3D rider, I could rotate the camera around, show um, movement much more accurately. Oh my word, my computer just said I've got 7% of power left. Wow. Uh, unfortunately, I'm running on a battery, so we might have to wrap this up really quickly. Uh, so yeah, the, the app really was to help demonstrate some of the accuracy, some of the mechanics of the movements, and to de demonstrate some of the principles of test riding. There we go, I've shortened it a lot. <laughs> Well, and the best way for people to get in touch with you is, what's the best way? Uh, through Facebook is probably the best. So uh, facebook.com forward slash master dressage or master dressage 3D. Excellent. Um, thank you, Peter, so much for coming on the show today. Uh, we've put a lot of time and effort into getting this together. <laughs> Um, thank you for coming and sharing with us. I know that what you've shared is helping people to build better relationships with their horses, to help them ride and compete better, more efficiently, and with more enjoyment. Another tool that helps dressage riders ride and train and compete more effectively is the My Show Horse Checklist, which is an online tool to help you efficiently pack your trailer for shows, lessons, clinics, or whatever. It's located at showhorseapp.com. And that is it for this episode. If you have any further questions, feel free to drop us a note, and we will get those answered for you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.